that's really cool. Um, so the real trick, the real trick, is that if this isn't fun, you can't make this work. This isn't about you winning as a GM. It's not us versus them. This is about making the best possible game for your players. And if you're not going to be a fan of their characters, do not run this game. Any game, ever. <laughs> Leave. Down. Because if you're not there to make your characters have a good time, that's, then don't. Then don't. If the game is about you winning as a GM, you right. don't need a game, you need a therapist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you look at the I mean if you if you look at all the ways that the players ask these questions, right? I want an easy escape route. Right? Or I will not be But I want an escape route. Cool. Right? I get in these tunnels, right? Don't make it a bad thing for that player. Punish them for what they want. If they say, I want to escape, and you say, cool, let's let you escape, and then have a chase where like, someone like sees them and goes, they're getting away! They have the medical supplies. It's like, oh, they didn't come for water after all. <laughs> Whatever, maybe they did. The mice said they did. Uh, I gotta be true to myself, right? Well, maybe they have something valuable. Uh, it's like half of the map, though. Then I have a step in back here. Right. You gotta make it. You gotta make it a thing. You gotta and make their thing work, right? If they want something, give it to them, and let that happen. And don't punish them for it. Okay? It's about it being fun. So, some important tips. Um, if you're responding to their players, you have to make it fun. Uh, after the game, you can ask if you picked up what they were laying down. At the end of the game, you can be like, "Hey, you said um, you wanted to go. Like, you you wanted an escape route, and I gave it to you. Is that what you were going for?" Because you didn't go through the tunnels. Did you not, not want to leave? Or is that just not good enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes they won't. Sometimes the players are like, there's these tunnels. And they're like, okay. What's the biggest threat? Yeah, I think there's the biggest threat. And then no one looks at the monkey ever again. Like, <laughs> yeah, the monkey in the suitcase, dude. <laughs> right? Talk to your players. It's okay to ask them afterwards to see if you did a good job. And if you're trying things for the first time, if you're laying, like, your, your players, like, please know that you're doing this for the first time, and then ask them afterwards if you think that, you know, if they think you did a good job. And it might not be good the first time. you got to keep at it. Like, coming up with things on the top of your head is hard, but, but you'll get there. Um, remember to give them what they want and make it so it's clear. So if someone says, I want a threat, make something threatening. You can't, you have, like, the, the, we'll go over the top of making it more threatening than what it was. Like, it said 14 bikers now, but now it's suitcase nukes. Things have gone down. <laughs> right? That's cool, but it's got to be, it's got to be heavy enough. Right? Um, it's okay, so take some time to think it through. So, if your player says to you, you know, I need a bigger, you're like, you know, what's the biggest threat here? It's okay to go, give me a minute. Let me think about that. And that's okay. And if you're telling your players you're doing something new, like, they're generally forgiving. They're like, everyone go take a snack break while I figure out something terrible. <laughs> right? um, your prep is a starting point, but players will tell you what they want more. So, like I said, I have 14 bikers. They're coming for water. That's great. Cool. That's good. Very simple, right? But the players will tell you what they want from that, which is why, like, almost all the things that I run are, like, very simple, very basic. Dude walks in with a gun, right? And what's the most dangerous thing? You know, the monkey. It's <laughs> always the monkey. Always the monkey. Um, well, you didn't notice they did a perception check, right? Um, so um, just because something is not known to the players does not mean it's not known. Like I said, so you have to be true to your prep, be true to what you've done. If you say these guys are coming for water, they're coming for water, right? So that's fine. Just make sure that, like, being, being internally consistent is an important part of being a quantum GM, right? One of the biggest problems people have come up to me with when they say, like, you GM used to make up show on the fly, you used to do anything, like, like you, and this is a fault when, this, when players, when GMs do this. I can make a fight last as long as I want by increasing the hit points, and that's bullshit. <laughs> if I say I have a lich, and I say he has 15 hit points, he has 15. <laughs> because if I'm going to be juicy, juicy with 
reality, oh, there have to be standards for the player's buy-in is there, right? If I say that, like, you know, he has 15 hit points, and you do a critical strike for, like, 12, and I'm like, damn! <coughs> What's dangerous here? Because that wasn't very interesting. We're working on our bread. Um, so, yeah. So, try to keep things keep things consistent. There needs to be a certain level of like understanding. Right? All right. And then it's not easy, and it takes time. So please be patient with it. It is worth working. All right. Um, so this is not just for apocalypse world. So I had like you know my talks were for apocalypse world and then. Um, so, perception checks are in every game, pretty much, for the most part. Um, you ask players with perception check, ask them to ask a question, right? It doesn't have to be from that place. If a player asks a question, it's because it's what they're interested in. They go, well, these players come up and make a perception check, roll it. Against, oh, well, what are, um, you roll 13. You're like, okay, great. chamber. Your party enters the deepest chamber in these dungeons. On a throne of bone and sinew sits the Lich King. His skeletal hounds look up at you and growl of unnatural sound as your footfalls echo the chamber. Thank you for bringing me the Sword of Dawn, says, barely looking in your direction. It is the final ingredient in my ritual. Oh, yes. Dun, dun. And they so, say yes. They say yes. <laughs> you planned these things. One, the Lich King has two skeletal hounds, and that's the death number. <laughs> right? If the king gets the sword of time, he can cast spells to release his body from the dungeon. Those are the two things that are going on in this room that I have planned out. Okay? So, the player asks for a perception check. Here we go. Alright, what questions they ask? Where does that ask? So, here we go. Let's go. Now it's your turn. The player asks, Where is my best escape route, way in or way past? Who? Corley, uh, the uh, person of Lich King has an escape route, a secret door. This, uh, so you notice that there's a door behind the bone, the throne yeah, of the bone. Yeah, so. yeah, and you see it fluttering. There's like, there's like an outline of a door behind it. And you see that it's behind him and those and those skeletal hounds. Cool, you have it. You have your goal. Awesome, cool. You want to get out of here? <laughs> we just need to take the sword and go. <laughs> right? I don't want to fight the king. I just need to get out. Right? And that's the problem. Because you're behind Lich King, but that's cool. We have an adventure going on. All right, which enemy is the most vulnerable to me? Claire. You see a glass jar on a shelf with the Lich King's beating heart in it. Yes, you do! <laughs> that is awesome! You see his beating heart up there on the wall. Yes. All right, which enemy is the biggest threat? The slave girl attached to him by a chain. And that's the most Oh, no. <laughs> she's the one who controls. Oh, she's controlling the Lich King. Your answer is Lich <laughs> Secret necromancer right. math. Um, which enemy, should, or what should I be on the lookout for? So this is like, I want a problem to solve. Uh, you're not picking up any magic from those skeletal hounds, but there's skeletal hound-shaped invisible things coming across this way. Oh, Ooh. so it's maybe not those things, maybe these other things? Other, the magical hounds that are like coming around behind you, you watch out for those. <laughs> yeah, the steam of March effect. Almost imperceptibly, the room is starting to shake. Yeah, 
Yeah. That goes back to the timer. <laughs> we start the new clock or the timer, whatever it is. Uh, all right, what is my enemy's true position? Yes. All of a sudden, you feel a draft of wind, and you look to notice a hole in the wall to your left that appears to be a peaking hole of some kind. Ooh, someone is watching this. Ugh. What is going on? <laughs> Who's in control here? This lady. Who's in control? <laughs> it's the girl on the chain. Smiling. Jim. Or the character holding the sword of Todd hears in their mind, yes, I want to free the Lich King. <laughs> <laughs> As it turns out, the player holding the sword of Todd is actually the guy who gets to make the decision. <laughs> yeah. The, the group's like, let's go! And he's like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you want. <laughs> oh, you're a blind man. All right, so that's it. How long did it? Pretty good. No? Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> requested this topic. I don't usually say, hey, do you talk about this, but I, I did. And uh, <laughs> there is a, uh, a kind of um, organization technique that has been uh, sweeping uh, the internet over the last few years called bullet journaling. And um, recently, people have been applying that to game mastering uh, because Game Masters try to apply everything to Game Master. <laughs> um, so Victor's going to specific. We actually there is a Google Plus group that he'll probably mention at some point uh, that exists specifically for people sharing their their cool shit that they've learned bullet journaling. And we're going to talk about bullet journaling for Game Masters with Victor Diaz. Hey everybody, how's everybody doing? Yeah. It's been a couple of hours, so if you need to step up and stretch or move your arms or legs or scream out like crazy, don't worry. I'll do it all the time, right? So my name is Victor Diaz. I am um, a content manager for the Google Plus page, um, Bullet Journaling for Game Masters. I also manage uh, the Savage Rifts for Savage Worlds games for Game Masters, and I have uh, quite a few other Google Plus pages that I work on. I also host the Savage Rifts podcast for the Rotohobo Show. And um, Red Streets and Timers for the ICRPG podcast. So please, if you want to take a listen to it, if you want to hear more of my voice without the face, um, you're more than welcome to come along and join me on that journey. So, bullet journals for Game Masters. <laughs> You've got a great face for radio. Exactly. See? <laughs> <laughs> bullet journals for Game Masters. So, bullet journals was created by Carol Ryder um, a number of years ago when he was a lot younger. He's 37, 38 now. And one of the reasons that he created the system, bullet journaling, was... He has attention deficit disorder, ADD, which probably every game master man does. I know I do. All I have to do is flip through the internet. I'm going through like 16 different games all at one time. <laughs> right? So bullet journaling for him helped him focus, helped him make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Bullet journaling for him is more of a system and method for him to be able to manage his day-to-day -day calendar, his to-do tasks, financial planning, general goals as a person, that reflection that you need to have on a day-to-day -day basis, which in today's society, there's so much information that we get inundated with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we don't take the time to focus on that, on ourselves. It's very introspective in that way. So anybody who's ever written a journal or has journaled in the long form, or, or even taken you know, art school and learned how to take a sketchbook and do your day-to-day -day drawing that improves your craft, Bullet journaling for him 
was his salvation. It helped him focus on him. It wasn't just a solution for ADD. It just happened to give him that focus that he needed in order to pay attention in school, to get through life, to pay the bills at the end of the month, to remind himself to call his mom every week, that kind of stuff, just the general day-to-day -day stuff. So when I started looking at his history and started looking at bullet journaling, I noticed that I had been doing the same thing for a number of years before that, but in longer form, writing, poems, art, charts, organizations, and so mine were a lot more scatterbrained. It looked more like I'm a college student, but I'm writing an elementary school spiral notebook, and there's pictures and drawings and pow and zoom and Batman in the corner and that kind of stuff. So they were a little creative, but they weren't quite, and there wasn't quite any method to it, any method to the madness. So once I started looking to see what he was doing, I noticed that there were some things that I could apply to that. If you guys have any questions when we go through this, please feel free. One of the things that I've really learned about bullet journaling, what a lot of the people on the Google Plus page have told me, is that the system is flexible enough to make every single person in the world who uses a journal unique to them. And that's where the genius of bullet journaling comes in. Everyone here is not gonna go home and start using the same method, start using the same ideas and the same methodology in that you're gonna be photocopying the same journal, because it's not gonna be the same. Every single person here is gonna have one different. Some are gonna be more on the creative side, they're gonna be more artistic, more colorful. Some are gonna be very minimalistic. You know, dots and dashes and squares and check marks and little lists. Whatever makes it work for you, that's the most important part of the system. So once again, uh, bulletjournal.com, if you haven't taken a look at that website, there's some really great videos that he's put together in order to get you started with it. He give you some templates, of course he does sell books. Um, that's primarily where he makes his money from. They're uh, electron, uh, I think they're electron. It's a style of books, but you can also pick up a moleskin. And they have some template pages in them, so it really helps to get you started. But whatever you do, don't go looking at bullet journaling in YouTube or Facebook or Pinterest. Start with the method first, because if you start comparing yourself to everyone else, you'll get lost in the minutia. There are hundreds of thousands of postings on Pinterest, YouTube, every website that you can think of and bloggers that use it. So it's really, really grown in the last, I would say 10 years. Yeah. In the last decade, it's really, really exploded all over the place. So we'll go through some of those things here. So you have to start somewhere. A journal and a pen. Now for us who live in the digital age, who did not grow up in the digital age, um, we know what a journal and pen is used for. We're probably more familiar with methods and styles and long handwriting, you know, um, shortcuts and different methods to be able to use a journal. But if you didn't grow up in that age, and you've grown up with computers most of your life, you really need to start considering the fact that a journal and a pen have been, there are studies that have been made that a journal and a pen allows you to retain more information. And you have to think about what you do when you type. You're dumping your mind into the computer. But when you write, you are physically and emotionally tying yourself to the words on the page. To have that pen in your hand, to write that drawing, some of you that are artists will know, every time you draw something, physically on the page. Because digitally, I don't get the same feel when I draw digitally. It's not the same kind of emotional content that I'm adding towards the picture, right? If you've ever drawn, even just a doodle, even if you like uh, Spider-Man or Batman, you draw the Batman symbols. I used to do that when I was a kid. I used to write Superman, I used to draw in the corners, and the teacher say, Vicky, you forgot your name. Well, how do you know it's my paper? Because I had Superman. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 Batman in the bottom right hand corner. Or I put pow, and pan, and zoom, you know, all over my paper. And, and it's funny, because at the time I didn't think about it, but I was emotionally attaching myself to that page. And those were usually the tests and the notes and the homework that I did really well with because I was physically attaching an emotional connection to that. So consider that. If you've never taken a journal before, if you've never taken, just grab a spiral notebook, go to the Walgreens, wherever you need to. Just take a little small one for 99 cents. Start out small, a ballpoint pen and a little notebook, and start using this method. Or just start journaling, just start writing, just start drawing. You'd be surprised the difference that it makes. Um, just to be able to get your mind onto a paper and be able to take care of it. Some of us have been doing this for years. Um, others consciously, others subconsciously. It's just the way we've been able to organize ourselves. So if you do it on a, on a tablet or if you journal or you keep track of things on, on your laptop or on your phone, 
seriously take a moment to think about how that's going to change if you decide to follow this method um, by using pen and paper. Sometimes the old ways are the good ways. So let's start out with one of the main reasons on how Carol did this. As you can see in this slide here, this is a traditional, you know, I have some squares, the long form paragraphs that are written right there. Um, this is pretty typical of what a lot of my notebooks looked like before I started doing this. Um, I used to write a lot, I used to take notes, I used to, I'm a list guy, I'm a to-do list guy. Gotta make it, gotta cross it off at the end of the day, or cross it off at the end of the month, and I have some dates next to it, some important phone numbers, I would keep things. Unfortunately, I'd have like 13 pages for the week. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too much going on, and I'm writing too much down because I'm forgetting a lot of it. What Carol suggested was rapid logging. Now, rapid logging, just like it says, be it for taking notes or journaling, students keep identifying benefits of writing by hand. That said, it takes time to be un it, it takes time and can be unorganized, which is what this list in this long form does. Rapid logging is a is a term that he created for being able to take a lot of notes really quickly and still bring up the reminders to yourself. Because really, when you journal, you're not journaling, or at least bullet journaling, you're not journaling because you're writing a diary entry. That's a diary, okay? You're not journaling because you're trying to capture the, the pretty picture of the flower that you saw outside. That's a sketchbook. This can be a little of both, or neither, or something new. That's the uniqueness of bullet journaling. Now, eventually, I'll get to where we're gonna move this into jamming, right? Because that's the whole point, using it in gaming. I mean, if you're a gamer, that's the whole point. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Um, when, when do I get my next dice roll? I live from dice roll to dice roll. <laughs> hour to hour, job to job. So one of the tools that we use in rapid um, logging is called bullets. Now there's three different types of bullets. And I managed to break these down into this particular syntax only because it was more universal for me to be able to do this as a talking point. Just because I use these three bullets doesn't mean you have to use them in the same way. So for example, the dark little dot is an encounter. Now for me, sometimes I'll be going along and attending a conference and I hear someone talking about on a, you know, floating on a paladin. <laughs> Stop, floating on a paladin. <laughs> Guess what's gonna happen in my game next, right? Because it's, it's funny, but it's fun. And that's half the reason why we play the games. And if you don't write down what you hear and what you see on a day-to-day, -day, then you're gonna go home three days from now and go, well, what, was that? what was that guy's name? What was that thing they were, the, pal the paladin thing? What's the whole story? But I guarantee you, if you take a pen to paper and invest emotionally, in the moment, it is absolutely amazing to me, amazing to me, how when you open that book up again on Sunday afternoon, when you're having that, you know, brandy, that cup of coffee, whatever makes you feel good, and you're going through your journal for the day and kind of capturing ideas, or maybe getting ready for the prep for Monday night, right? You look at that floating paladin, oh yeah, that was hysterical when they were floating on <laughs> down side up, and there's tentacles underneath, and he's running, and all of a sudden, oh, you get this rush of emotion, right? You get this rush of emotion, and the laughter, and the moment comes back, because you're emotionally tied to the page of the moment. You put pen to paper. Now granted, you can get the same feeling digitally because there is a generation that grew up in the digital age. So that you can still get that same sense of emotion, but the sense of satisfaction, the sense of bringing that book onto the page. It's like getting a new rule book, and you just got the, the I'll, I'll be right with that question. You get the new D&D 5th edition, right? It just came out, you put it on the, on, on the table, and you're ready to play, and you're excited, and the players see it, and they love it. But it's just as exciting to put your own rule book as a game master with your own notes on the table, too. So consider that if you've grown up in the digital age, you like laptops, you like tablets, this is a good way to get all that off the table. To be able to use that as a tool so you can be emotionally attached to your game. Because we already are for the most part. So, encounters is one, notes is another. Now this is a dash, this is a secondary bullet that you can use. You don't have to use it for notes, I just use it for notes, just to relate to it. So, I could write the encounter of the floating paladin, or we can, the slaves, uh, the slavers, and underneath that, we can put the color of the slavers, maybe some stats, maybe some names. And if you go on, you can see that I use a circle, an open bullet, for an NPC or a monster. Seems really simple, doesn't it? It is. It's not that difficult. It is a really simple system. The tough part is putting it to work. So those are three different kinds of bullets. Now when we talk about encounters, we're talking about just a solid dot, right? Use a solid dot to be able to represent your encounters. And instead of a checkbox, instead of an underline, instead of a big caption title, just write it on there. And you'd be surprised the minimalist approach of using those three things to be able to create um, sort of a fast and 
clean method for you to log down all those ideas. And you can even use these when you're using them at the table as ideas that your players have brought to you. Maybe some ideas that later on you want to use the suggestion that they gave, right? Like that monkey didn't get killed and he didn't go off with that, with that backpack nuke, but no, to sell, you know, put a dash, monkey did not die. <laughs> right? We need to reuse that one at the table. At the table. And it doesn't need to be verbose. You don't need to go and write the dissertation of you know exploding monkeys right there on that page. Right? You don't need to do that. You just need a quick look. Monkey did not die. That's simple. Put a dash next to it. Then next week, next Sunday, when you're having that second glass of wine and you're planning your Monday night game, and go, okay, where was that page at? You go back and you look a couple pages back from Monday for the power of all right there, monkey, monkey did not, yeah, the monkey didn't die last time. I need to reuse that. New game, new page. Death of the monkey, right? And all of a sudden, you go on with it. And if you take a look at, at my journal, I was writing on the bottom of these, and I have open circles, and it's a slavers, and monkey, monkey pet with backpack nuke, a floating paladin, um, the, the dragons, that was a good one, I like that one. Um, the four horsemen of apocalypse, I wrote that down, going, I need to use that somewhere. And then the list king with the slave girl. Those are all things that I want to use, that I want to remember, and I'm going to be emotionally attached to that note, and it's going to all come floating back to me in a week from now, and it's some kind of drunken state in the corner, and you know, <laughs> one night, you know, I'm going to figure that out. So these are different methods for you to use this kind of like a checklist. So you have the doc. That means that for me, the encounter's not complete yet. It's something I can use or something I want to do. And the reason we go through the X, the greater than, the less than symbol, and the line through is because I always write in my journal in ink. I don't use pencil. You don't erase. It's like life. Once, it's, once it exists, it exists. The only thing you can do is change. Right? You can't erase it. You can't go back. You can't go over. You have to turn the page and move forward. But that doesn't mean you can't reflect on what's already been there. So if you take an X, that means I've done that. I've used that. We don't use a checkbox. We don't use a check mark. That doesn't mean you can't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. This is just my method. Every single person is going to have a unique way, but this is my way, my way. If I'm going to move the encounter in the future, say we didn't kill the monkey, but I have a dot next to that saying that's an encounter that I want to do. Well, now I'm going to put a greater than arrow, and I know that I need to look for it for further along that same encounter note. I need to look for that one further along on the next few pages because I'm moving that forward in time. I didn't use it today. I didn't use it the following session or the following session, but I know I, didn't, I, I need to move that forward. So that's just... A quick little review for me to be able to take a look at what needs to be done next. And then the encounter is moved to collections. Now, collections is a different topic that we'll go on here in just a few minutes, but in this case, I'll put a less than symbol and I'll move that to um, the, a large list of collections of encounters that I want to use in different various games. And it's just a quick notation for you to be able to see exactly what you've done with what you've done with it, because you're not going to erase it if it ain't. And the last but not least, this encounter wasn't needed. Say I put six bullet points, there were six encounters for this game, and this one just, you know, the slave girl boyfriend was there in a separate room trapped also. Um, I don't know, I didn't need that one. I just put a line through it. It made sense, didn't need to use it, or maybe I needed to forward it, right? So that's just an example of how you can use encounters for those bullet points there. Let's talk about another bullet point. Now this was the open bullet point, monsters or NPCs, and this one's pretty flexible for me. I use this a lot for lots of different things. Um, one of them is, of course, TPK. Everybody knows what that is. I killed the party. Okay, so what's going to happen right there? Or that's what I anticipate. Or maybe that's a recording of what I thought happened, you know, a history of what happened during that game. Also, an NPC's name, right? Use a circle. You can use it for the big bad end guy. You can use it for any kind of monster. So in my book, you're going to see three things. You're going to see a dot with an encounter name of some type, you know, well, it's just a quick sentence. Some dashes with some notes, maybe there's lava, maybe they're floating on the paladin of lava, you know, whatever, and then um, the name of the paladin, and I'm gonna put a circle next to that. So there, in really short form, I've been a really, con I've, I've created a really concise encounter, right? So it's an easy way for you to log that. So three different ways to be able to do that. Now, notes on the dash. Um, this is, I get a little more verbose when it comes to the notes, but it's my preference. It doesn't need to be your way. Remember, every single one of our journals is gonna be unique. Um, in this case, we talked about um, the dragon and the rescuing the princess, and they found the magic dagger, so I wrote, Jack found the magic dagger. Jack's one of the characters in the game. Underneath that encounter, I also put, the party missed the secret entrance. 
Maybe they didn't find that um, secret entrance behind the religious, religious throne. And maybe they missed it. I need to remember that because next time we go back, they're still going to be in the room. So note to self, right? And then, of course, Jack found the magic dagger, but that's the cursed dagger. So I cursed them with the magic dagger. Just making notation, log notes. These are notes for me um, for that encounter. So uh, here comes the fun part. This is where you get is an example where you can mix and match them. Okay. So real simple, we'll go through this. And it's a really, really basic method. This can get really complicated really fast. So what you need to be careful of is don't use too many bullets, bullet types. Just stick to three simple ones. If you like a flower, a heart, and a phone, then use a flower, a heart, and a phone. Use a square, a triangle, and a circle. Use them however. Just make sure that you're consistent in your use of bullets because it's your journey. Only you need to look at it. Only you need to read it. And really, for me, I see it like a, a secret manual. Because people look at it and go, what is this? Well, what does it mean when you put the star next to it? Now? Why is this highlighted? Well, what does the square mean? And only I know that. So it's, it's kind of a cool, neat, convenient tool that uh, makes it unique to everybody. So let's explain this. For those of you who have never read it, um, the 16 hit point dragon. I believe it's Adam Cobo's blog, the list of, of what he did. So here's an example of that. The 16 hit point dragon is an NPC, or it's, it's the monster in this case. One of the encounters is he sets fire to the town. He's gonna eat an NPC, and I expect him to crush a building. Which building? I put a note, the apothecary's building. Now there's an NPC that saves the PC's life. Who is that? I'm gonna put a note, the wizard's the one who's gonna save me the, uh, the PC's life. And really quick, that's an entire encounter. That could be an entire entire game right then and there, right? It's a really, really simple method. It does not have to be overly complicated. I think when people start writing journaling, they get into that old habit of um, English term papers. 500 word, 500 word pages, three paragraphs, right? Double space type, the whole nine. Um, a journal doesn't have to be like that. And a lot of this can be done visually. You can draw a dragon if you're artistic draw the wizard, draw the apothecary building, draw the map, draw an arrow, 16 hit points, and that's it. It's the same page. Um, <coughs> granted, more space, but it's going to look a lot nicer than it is going to be with uh, just the bullets. <coughs> Any questions on that so far? No? Very simple. Three things. Bullets, right? Encounters, notes, NPCs. Basics. Now, signifiers is something that was really unique that I found um, could be a lot of fun. And you could go crazy with these two, so you need to be careful. Um, if you haven't figured it out already, you can create your own set of bullets and your own set of signifiers. Do that as like your second or third page in your journal. That way, if you forget or you're using 100 signifiers, <laughs> you have a key. So you yourself can figure out your own code. Just don't let nobody else get the book. You never know what so I use two signifiers. One is a star. Usually this means this is a priority. This is a hot item. This is something that either needs to happen in encounter, it's an important note, or it's a um, important NPC or monster. So the big bad end guy is going to get a, a star with a circle, NPC, big bad end guy, monster, troll, whatever. Just, you know, can't close out of the dark and stuff. The second one um, is an exclamation point, right? Exclamation point is, a, is usually a unique idea. So a lot of these circles that I got for the NPC encounters that we were talking about throughout the day today, We'll probably get an exclamation point next to the ones I like, right? Because I'm going to turn those into what I call game changers. And a game changer is when you've been playing along first, second level characters, and bam, ninth level pal anti paladin shows up. And everybody's like, ooh, exclamation point. That's going to be a game changer. So again, real simple signifiers, real simple. These are just two. With that combination of the other three, now you're looking at nine or ten different variations you can Exclamation point, circle, big bad egg guy, anti okay? Really simple. You don't have to make it very complex unless that's how you like your game. Then feel free. But if you use this as a base, as a starting method, it should help out a lot. So putting it all together now, this is where it gets a little more complicated. We start talking about the 16 hit point dragon again. And at the top, you can see that I made a note. And one of the notations is the, no the notes for me. Because if the players don't know what the date is, well, who are they going to ask? The person who runs the world, right? Not God, the GM. Okay. Augustus 12, 1456, the year of the dragon. That's a note for the DM. The name of the monster is going to be the 16 hit point dragon that attacks the town. And we kind of established that already. Now I put a star next to each an NPC. In 
important to the party. So I need that to happen. That's, that's, a, that's an important part of that whole encounter. If the dragon doesn't eat somebody, it's not going to scare the, the characters into doing what they need to do to rescue the town, or run in fear, or do what characters do. I noted that it needs to be the apothecary. It doesn't have to be, but it's a note. That's who I expect the dragon to get. But if another opportunity presents itself, listen to your character, listen to your players, take their advice, and go with it. It's not written in stone. These are just notations as a guide for us, right? So we put down another dot for destroys the building by landing on it. He sets fire to the city where the PCs are. And then this is a game changer. The NPC saves the PC's life, but he dies in a horrible death from the dragon. Maybe he's engulfed in flames and his skin slops off of him. And oh my god, they killed off John the Baptist or something. Right? <laughs> so now the players are like, oh my god, you know, they killed the cleric. They killed John, our friend, uh, our leader, our mentor, whatever it may be. So that's a game changer. And in a real short, simple form, you have yourself an entire encounter. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. It should be really simple. It's a really simple concept until you look it up on Facebook and then you're like, oh my God, these people are nuts. <laughs> what do these people do all <laughs> Does everybody know what a bullet journal is? Have you ever heard of that term before or ever used that or seen that? Yeah, for those couple of you that know what I'm talking about, you go look at other people's stuff and you're like, these people don't have love. <laughs> How many journal entries do they go through to get that calendar perfect on the center of the page every time, colored with backgrounds and watercolors and sprinkles and <laughs> notes, pay $40 on 13165 of 15th Avenue or something. Well, it's, it's just crazy, it's right? The, it's the new fad for the scrapbookers. Yeah, it's the new fad. Well, I think it should be a new fad for the GMs, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, because there's so much we can learn from each other as a community. And without the internet, I think that it would be a lot slower development. So now that we have this method, and now that we get together to sit and talk about it, hopefully you can use these, these same methods to uh, improve your journaling. If you've never started a journal, if you've never done any journaling before, um, it's really difficult for me to explain to you the gratification of having a 100-page book of just your work as a gamer. Not just as a person, not just a sketch artist, a development, a production designer, not like that. As a gamer, to have a 100-page journal sitting at home. For me, the moment was extremely gratifying. When I, I had, in high school, uh, a graph, a graph paper comic book. For those of you who know chemistry, physics, a lot of science, you'll know what those are. It's about 100 pages or so. And it's old and wrinkled and beaten and you know, 1986 on it and all that other fun stuff. The most gratifying moment for me was when my oldest son was 12 years old, and he came to me, and he pulled it off the shelf, and he had brought it to me. He's like, Dad, what is this? He started looking through, wow, that's awesome. Dad, who wrote this? This is a good story. Why don't we play this game? <laughs> for me, I told him, thanks, son, that's mine. That's mine from when I was your age. That was extremely gratifying for me, but I didn't realize what I had until, you know, life experience, time goes by, and then you start to go through your son's room one day, picking up his stuff, because, you know, we picked up after our kids all the time. We still do. I got a 24-year-old and still picking up. <laughs> and um, you go through his stuff, and you find this book, this spiral notebook, and it says, bam, pow, I'm in Superman. Where did he get that from, right? So extremely <laughs> satisfying to be able to have that moment, at least for me and my family and my kids. And there are different moments that that'll happen. You'll turn to that one page, and you'll cry and bawl your eyes out, because that was the day your grandmother died, and you wrote that flower, and you, you wrote that heartfelt poem about it. Because you had to get it out. But that's how we emotionally tie ourselves to the game, to the people, and to the stories. You've got to do it by hand on pen and paper because a digital screen just doesn't do it for you. And I didn't get to your message. You I'm going to contest you directly. Whether or not this kind of communication or this kind of communication is better is a deep personal thing like sexuality. Um, yeah, it, it's... Hold on, hold on. And I, I mean, so I'm, 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 take, I'm not taking up my cause, because I'm, I'm, I'm like you. Right? I agree. If, I, if I wanted to type this into a phone, I would want to take sure. this metal dice and throw them in the wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I know that, I, I know, for instance, someone who had a kind of dysgraphia that, or dis, that, 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 was, that was based on this kind of emotion. Right. And as soon as he got onto a computer, his life turned around and his emotions could now come out on the computer. Because of a fundamentally different way in which his body wired those feelings to the hands, so the, the hands communicate, and I think that's a, a, part, a deep partition. Do the commands, do the hands communicate feeling like this, or do they communicate like that? And I think that's a fundamental difference between people. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, those are unique situations. For the, and for the most part, it's not so much the act as it is the process. Whether you type on a computer and you go through that process because because of the issues that you have mentally, physically, and the way you know, you've been wired, it's the process of you putting them down there. It just made it easier for that person to eventually well, connect I'm, with I'm you. definitely like you. Right? I'm, I can't sure. I love these I'm more you talking about yeah. your marks. You sure. can't do that on a computer. Sure, and, yeah, and you can't do that. And those little notes and those little codes, yeah. the computer won't code it the way you want it to. Yeah. You have to code it the way the computer wants it to in order for the yeah, idea to be what you want. So who's the slave there? Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more of a process, though, right? It's more about the process of you sitting there and going through, whether it's on a paper journal, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on a tablet, on a laptop, on a large whiteboard, and you know, whether it's a big old sheet of graph paper, or like some artists, whether they're splashing paint on a 30-foot canvas on the wall. It's that emotional connection that's going to remind you, that's going to touch you, that's going to make you remember where you were, what you were doing, and what you're talking about. And as gamers, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, okay, that's a cool situation, how am I going to put that in the game? And these tools allow you to recall that quickly, record that quickly, so you're not, like I said, making a dissertation on you know, cosmic science. This might even be um, applicable if you use like index cards for individual things that then you can Correct. Swap, swap them around as you want to do it sure. to build a, a, sure. a game. Sure, I used to know somebody who had a, a big old journal, and it's funny because their journal wasn't filled, it wasn't handwritten. What they had done is they had taken um, clippings from magazines, they had taken small drawings, signatures, other things, and they, they glued them all over. So it looked like it had a bunch of cards and papers and articles all sticking out of this big old big one inch journal. But that was their journal. It's what connected them to the moment. Yeah. So some of the examples that I'd like to show you here are various journals and various different methods and ways you can do them. This is just one way. It is not the only way. It is not the right way. It is just the unique way for this person. So a lot of people say journals, are, you know, and I've been preaching it here, the journals are unique and journals are your own, but there's no reason you can't use other people's ideas. Those are PDFs and templates, right? We can get them all off the internet. You can print them out and put them in a three-ring binder, and that could be your journal. Or you can hand copy those and take whatever bits and pieces that you like and put them in your own journal. So feel free to look for those templates and look for that stuff. Just don't compare your journal to theirs. Everybody has different artistic abilities. Everybody has different writing abilities. No one's going to judge you on your journal except for you. So one of the things that we had talked about earlier was collections. Collections are really cool because in a bullet journal, once you get all your signifiers and all your bullets together, now you can start creating things like an index. An index at the beginning of your book, you put all of your pages, you record every single note of where your pages are. So for example, if you take a big section of your notebook and you use it as encounters, or as you go through the years, because some notebooks will take you years to go through, page 38 will have an encounter, 59 through 63 is all one big encounter. So you would write encounters, 58, 63 through 64, 121, 152, 153, 154, and as you go, you would add those and change those. And that's just one set of collections. This is some of the collections that I have in my journal. And they're just long lists of ideas, single bullet lines of ideas of things to do, whether it's custom tables on you know, colors of tentacles, um, magical <laughs> items, floating paladins, whatever they may be. Um, those, those are all different collections you can do. This is probably, for me, the most valuable recording tool for bullet journaling. Because I can take the little notes that I did, put them in a, you know, forward them, put lines to them, put a forward arrow, and put them into a collection. And then I can save it and reuse it. So when the party goes left and should have gone right, hey, let's get out the random table of collections and see what kind of encounter I can give them tonight. That's one of the things that I like to do with collections. Now collections take um, such a myriad of capabilities that you can pull from. I mean, literally, colors of gems, monsters, dragons, powder and armor, explosive flying monsters. <laughs> whatever you want to put on it. Um, it can take so many that you need to be careful not to make your collection so big that it becomes a bullet journal of collections. Because that's not what it's about, right? That's not what bullet journaling is about. It's great as a game master to be able to have that, but you want to make sure that these things are going to be something that you can use, um, not just a collection of random stuff. Because if that's the case, you can use OneNote, you can use your computer, take your camera, take pictures of pages, and there's your collection. There's your album. So as I was saying earlier, collections, 
one example of how you can do that is you can do that in spreads, and when you write your index out, you can write out that the combat encounters take place on pages five through 10. And then you'll put a comma, and then if and when you write another combat encounter, U37, comma, 105, comma. This way, when you're looking through your index, it's very hard to create a table of contents and stick to that table of contents. You have to kind of fill it in as you go. So again, you can look at uh, a lot more details on how to take care of collections and do with an index um, on the website for bulletjournals.com. So I use mine as a campaign planner. And a lot of the times, it's an entire page of just step one, you know, encounter number one. Just like we did with the 16 hit point dragon, only I won't fill in the details. I'll just put in a bullet point or an open bullet point to my main, and I'll know that this is step one, this is step two, this is step three. Very simple outline. And you can do multiple campaigns in there, and you can mix and match them as you need. But that's primarily how I use mine. Now, everybody's gonna say, now, you mean you plan out your entire campaign? Well, sure I do, but does it ever run that way? <laughs> we need to be realistic. No, no player's ever gonna go from step one to step 10 and follow that word for word verbatim. But if you don't have a plan, it makes it a little more difficult for you as a GM to be able to go through that. So here's a good example from Abner Ravenwood from Toy and Prop Masters. Um, now, yeah, now you can see the artistic value in that, right? Now, he uses long form. He uses long cursive form to be able to keep his journal. He uses mostly his journal for work. He is a toy and prop maker. So it, it kind of makes sense, but this is an older style of journaling that is not the bullet method. So this is a good example of what not to do. <laughs> right? It looks good, it looks pretty. I'd like to be able to draw like that. It looks good, but that's a good example of what not to do. It's too verbose. The pictures are cool. He has some nice notations in there, but it probably would have been better just for two or three bullets next to each one. Major ideas, especially if you're doing it for gaming, right? He does it for his job, so that might have other implications that he didn't hear details from you. Here's a good example. Yeah, I, I really like Hank Grant's style. If you guys have never looked at the YouTube video where he explains his journals, really, really great method. But it is his own method. It is his method to his madness, and that's okay. Mine's are just as bad. They're just as crazy looking, just as scribbled out, markered over, and coffee spilled on. One of the things I like about this is that this is good for a two-page spread, particularly if you have a small notebook. You put your map on one side. You notice he's using bullets, and he just happens to fill them in in colors with numbers so they match you know, the, the encounters on the map. And he's titled it at the top, Dark House. You can easily put a dot on that, create that as an encounter. Or as a circle, you know, open bullet, if you wanted to name the guardhouse, the guardhouse of the black, black knives or whatever. And then, of course, he went through and he put down his timers, threes, and, and trees. Very, very good method. That's a good example of a, of a bullet journal using his own method. Here's another one. This is from the MSJX blog. I really like this because it's really minimal, and it's, it's really... It's really his. It almost looks like it's notes that he took during the game, not so much as something that he had planned out, which could be a possibility, but he didn't explain it. And there's lots of typos and lots of other things in there. And just as you can see between the three examples, you have to make your own method. There's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. You just have to do it. In this example, these are different journals from um, Shanna Germain from uh, Monty Cook Games. What she happens to do with Relic Journaling is she creates a bullet journal, and a small one. Is it okay here, 25, 50 page journal for every character that she plays in the campaign she plays? She personalizes the covers, she puts stickers on them, she uses different labels to, you know, for different sections of the book. But again, she's created her own method. It works for her. And she's admitted she's used different, different types of bullets, different types of signifiers. Now here's one I really like. This one's absolutely beautiful. And believe it or not, this is um, a character sheet for a wizard or a warlock and his spellbook. You start looking at the runes, you can see strength, dexterity, constitution, charisma, the different codes for the, the, the abyssal, the celestial, skill, all the different things there. Really, really creative, right? Really, really creative, beautiful journal to look at. But no one sees this but him. And that's okay, this is what he likes. This is a player's journal. That's something that he did, handmade paper. Really beautiful journal, I wish I could show you more pages from it. But I really like that as a good example. You notice that that's very, very artistic, but it's still functional. You can still use it as a player character. If that's what allows him to be able to focus on his game, and that's where he wants to spend his time to make beautiful character sheets like that, more power to him. I wish I had the, uh, the ability and time to do so. So here's a few warnings. Don't worry about making mistakes. Write in ink, write in color, paint, draw. Tear a page out, fold a page in half. 
put a bookmark on it, put a sticker on it, paste a bunch of post-it notes and a bunch of magazines and pictures from books and other stuff in there. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. I cover up my pages where I draw something and it goes crooked or the base is all crazy looking or whatever. Uh, I'll get an NPC portrait and just look on the top. It looks a lot better that way. Yeah. But I give it a good try, right? Um, again, I've said it before, don't compare yourself to others. What you're going to find out is that there's going to be 600,000 people on the internet who are trying to sell their bullet journal templates, their bullet journals to you, and you'll look at theirs and go, wow, they spent a thousand hours you know, putting their bullet journal together. How am I ever going to get there? Um, it, it is a process. You just have to go through it. So don't compare yourself to others. Take it with you everywhere. As you can see, I have mine. I was running out of ink earlier. I had to wait a minute to let the ink come back in and write a few more notes, but take it everywhere. And, Write everything that you possibly can with it because you never know what you can use for a game. It's a marathon, not a race. It's taken me, let's see, the beginning of this book starts last year, July 20. I'm only halfway through that journal. I've carried the book around with me for over a year and a half. And you would think, wow, wouldn't you have written more? Wouldn't you have drawn more? Not necessarily. Because for a game master, it's not about day to day, every day, right, right in your journal, pardon me. Um, you don't have to carry a calendar around, you don't have to draw a beautiful picture, right? It's just when you get that moment, when you get that epiphany going, oh, yeah, of course, we're apocalypse, take over the world, except for this guy. And it's when you write it down and you take it with you. At least that's what my, I have another journal that I use for work, that's other. Same methods, same madness, but uh, it is what it is. And last but not least, don't feel obligated that you need to write on your journal. You don't need to. You don't need to be on it every day. That's about it. That's bullet journaling for game master. Thank you, Victor. Okay, so uh, we are pressed for time at this point, which, you know, sometimes you end up with a bunch of time, sometimes you end up with no time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and Final speaker, and I do want to give an apology to Tracy Sizemore because we are going to have to bump her presentation, but we will get it out to you somehow, somewhere. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up. Um, she is one of the owners of Magpie Games. Uh, she has brought my daughter Joy multiple times uh, with <laughs> Apillion, which is a powered by the Apocalypse game that is about. Uh, Friendship being magical among baby dragons. <laughs> and her name is Marissa Kelly, and I will bring her up now. Hello. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about one shots uh, because I know we're at a convention and a lot of you are forced to run these things. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to note that to be good at this, you don't have to like it. Um, I fucking hate one shots. <laughs> I hate playing in them. I hate running them. <coughs> I generally just hate everything about them. <laughs> and that's why I try to boil down what I do with them to only good things. Because <laughs> I don't take joy in any of the extra shit <laughs> that comes along with it. Um, so, hopefully that's a little inspirational to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over just a few things uh, that you can use uh, during your game. During our switching our microphones. Uh, during your games to make things uh, go a little smoother. Um, so first, I think it's really important that we set expectations for the players that are sitting down at your one-shot table. Um, it's just going to go a lot smoother um, if everybody knows what to expect and why and when they might be disappointed before it happens. <laughs> um, so, for example, um, you have to try to balance time versus spotlight. Um, so what I generally do is I tell them what the schedule is. Um, I say, we're going to do character creation, we're going to go for this long, then we're going to have a break, 
and then we're going to go come back, play, and then have uh, an epilogue, and then have a quick round of Rose of New Thorns, uh, where I hear player feedback. Um, I think uh, you're also going to have to tell that there might be trade-offs. So that is mechanics versus story versus uh, spotlight versus whatever else uh, your system demands of you and your uh, adventure or your situation. Like, hey, we don't know any about each other. Uh, so I usually use the X card as a tool at the table to help manage those expectations and things that might come up that I don't want to anticipate. So I don't want to have to think I'm going to offend you. I want you to tell me I've offended you and then we, we fix it and move on. I don't want to be worried about all the things that I don't know about you, all the things you don't know about me. Like, I have this tool on the table for that, so that's one thing off my plate. It's self-care. You have to trust everybody at the table to do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, managing, prepare them to manage their expectations. If you go off on your own, uh, that's cool, but I will not give you as much spot. So if that's a cool thing you need to do, do it, man. But I'm gonna focus on where the most of the party is probably at. So if you can help me out and try and stick with the party as much as possible, come up with excuses as your character to go with them and do the thing, that's cool. I make all of this very explicit. I pretty much literally say this to them <laughs> verbatim so that everybody's on the same page and everybody's working uh, just as hard as I am <laughs> to make a one-shot meaningful um, because that can be really hard. Um, and then internally, I also set an expectation of uh, conflict. Um, so as characters are being introduced, um, I take notes, like Mr. Diaz was talking about, um, and I try and set up things where there's one conflict or note or highlight that I bring up during the game, or at least try to emotionally engage that character's concept in my game. And that's a lot different than uh, what we are hearing about earlier, where when you have a slow burn, you can you know, work with one character for one session and that you know, sort of episodic play. When you're in a one shot, there's more pressure to make sure that you aren't ignoring a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Um, uh, but that's not to say that you don't involve the player or the character's concept that was cooler than everyone else's. Like, go with that, but also make sure you touch on everybody else's cool thing um, while while exploring that together. Um, I would also say taking a break is great. Have a scheduled break where after character creation, you can gather up all your notes make a new like note of adventure, of your adventure, and then have everyone come back and you start. The pressure to do that immediately uh, is really high, <laughs> um, but having everybody go away, take a break, think about their characters, think about cool things they might wanna do, it's not just for you, I think it's actually for the players too. Um, everybody, it's hard to operate on you know, 100 all the time, so give yourself time, even though you don't think you need it. Um, cool. So uh, I think a challenge that we run into for one shots is uh, system versus story balance. So where do we take the time to explain and to be true to the system that we're running, and where do we skip over that or sacrifice something to be true to the story that we're trying to tell in such a small, short amount of time. So I think it's important for me, as a, you know, both a business professional in the field and a hobbyist running games for people, uh, why, I'm, why I'm running the game is really important. If it is a demo or a play test, I'm going to run my one shot very differently than if I'm just running it to make people have fun or expose them to the game in general. Um, <laughs> but I usually do, I would say that you should tell them uh, when you're making these concessions while you're doing it. 
So for example, usually I would do x, but we're short on time, so we're gonna do y instead. And you're telling the player what you're doing. You're not like in front of them, <laughs> hoping that they understand your reference or that they, you just don't have to take a chance, right? If that they think you're skipping over them, that they think you're being unfair, because there's a lot of trust that goes into running a one shot that doesn't really, you just don't get as much leniency there as you would with a campaign. Um, and uh, I would say that you should go with the emotional impact of the scene, because that's what's gonna stick with people, uh, like Mr. Beals was talking about, the emotion behind why the characters are doing things, the crazy stuff that's happening, that's where I think you should probably follow the train. Um, if there is a giant combat scene that should happen here and you have 30 minutes left, be like, cool, normally we would do roll initiative right now, but instead, I'm gonna have each of you do one cool thing. Brian, what's the cool thing you do? And then we move on, right? And I say, and he goes, he, pick, he, goes, he moves to pick up his dice, and I say, no man, that happens, you're a badass. Aaron, how are you a badass? <laughs> right, and that's because I told them, this is not how the game works. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go off and buy this game thinking that it's going to do this for you. This is what we're doing together to manage the time that we have. Um, uh, and then I would say don't skip things, uh, necessarily. Uh, I know that's a big draw and sort of sounds like what I've been saying. But instead, uh, show and describe people uh, to people what they would have been doing if we had more time. Uh, so. If the players have spent too much time planning out their assault, and we don't have time for the assault, acknowledge their cool planning, right? Like, be, like literally say, you set up an amazing break-in, and we don't have time for this, but I would like, this is so cool, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Be true in your describing how their break-in goes, even though you're breaking the rules, and be like, when you face down the big bad, what do you do? Because that's why they were breaking in. That's why it was so important that they did this. Um, and, in, and then finally we're talking about, I like to do epilogue. And on that note, closure is very powerful and emotional and needed. So it's important when, uh, I would say it's more important than what went on in your session is that your players feel like they have a sense of closure. Because for better or worse, our brains don't really register all the progress you made <laughs> without that sense of closure. Um, and that can come in a lot of ways, but you're really fighting against momentum. All this world building that you've been working with, doing together, um, has a lot of force behind it, and it needs a release. And epilogues are a very easy way to do that. Um, and so, when you do an epilogue, I would say that each character needs their own. Like, I, as the GM, am gonna start that off, I'm gonna model that, I'm gonna say, this is what happens with the bad guys, this is what I see as the immediate conflict resolution, and then I let each player do their own epilogue. Whether or not that is in the immediate scene, like I was talking about earlier, what's one cool thing that they do, or I might do that, and on top of that, get to say, what do what happens to your wizard later on? Does he give up his power and become a fairy king? Does he like become a sad homeless man in the street? Like we want to know where this could have gone because we'll never do this again. It is a one shot. <laughs> you might fantasize about it. Tell us, tell us the cool thing. <laughs> because we want to know because that's all we have, right? Don't. Don't imagine that you're gonna come back here, work with what you have. Um, and I think, again, having showing sharing that spotlight shows that you are trying to be fair, but you couldn't, right? Like, I can't get to everybody. I couldn't show off everybody's cool one thing. But again, it's important to build that trust and then to reinforce that trust that you had with your players, that they like were willing to spend four hours of their time for a game that they will never play again with you. <laughs> or each other. Um, and so, I'd say, um, 
just for trying wrap things up, uh, that you should try again. <laughs> so one shots can suck. There's a lot of damage control you can do in the moment. Uh, even last night, I checked the clock and was like, holy shit, I have 30 minutes. <laughs> I have had two scenes. <laughs> and I fit four more scenes in 30 minutes. Whoa. Yeah. And they were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Give him whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> and epilogue. And feedback. And I think I did at the end have to ask my players for 10 more minutes for feedback. Uh, and, and give them an exit <laughs> in case they did not have that time. Um, but even if you do have sort of a train wreck of a one shot, doing it again is important. And I think one of the most uh, awesome advice I got was from a friend, Ben Taylor, who told me, I was getting really bored of running one shots because as I said, I hate them. And then I was kind of doing the same scenario over and over again. And I was like, oh my God, if I see one more baby dragon do this stupid thing one more time, I'm just gonna not role play ever again. <laughs> and Ben was like, well, what I do is every time I role play, I try and top, or GM, I try and top myself. Like that's simple and way better than what I was doing. <laughs> and so I try and make every time I run the same game over and over again that much better. So even if I do use the same ideas again, that I'm doing it in such a way that I'm topping myself and doing better, even if I thought I ran the best damn game of Urban Shadows I've ever run as a one shot, next time I'm gonna do it even better. And I think that, that can be motivating. Uh, in, a, in a space where I would say motivation is kind of lacking. <laughs> so make it a game for yourself as the GM. Enjoy yourself. In Bluebeard's Bride, which, uh, which I wrote and published as well, along with a couple other awesome ladies, we have, it's a one-shot game by design, but you can play it over and over again. And as a GM, what I do is I use former brides who have died in the game in my next game for future players. Players don't know that. <laughs> players will never know that. Because if I tell them, guess what? They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun for me. And I think it's really important that you find what makes it fun for you, even though one shots suck. Because, <laughs> because they can be really special in that you can take chances and risks that you might not want to allow yourself to do in a campaign. No, you should do that. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm going to hand it back over to our maestro, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Right, that was awesome. So, uh, again, I apologize to Tracy. Uh, I'm super bummed. But we do have another uh, presentation coming in, and as a uh, white heterosexual male, I don't feel like I should bump the inclusivity panel that's coming up next. So uh, I'm going to pass it on from here. Hope everybody had a good time. Please reach out to me. I'm easy to find if you want to do this next year. Take care. Yeah.